Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, week nine. We're still doing uh, the second part of week nine. I know next week is going to be a spring break, so hopefully you guys will enjoy yourselves during that time. I try to minimize the work as much as possible during the spring break so that you guys will enjoy your, your, uh, your rest, so that you can stay with your family and friends and so on and so forth. And uh, we will resume after the spring break, basically. I think we will be done with chapter 40 by the end of the day today. And we should be ready for the exam in terms of uh, the materials and content. However, the exam is not going to be immediately after spring break. So I think we need to have it the week after. So that is basically how the plan was originally, I think. And this is how we're going to stick with that plan. Uh, so this is the overall thing. So again, the chapters covered in this exam are chapters, four chapters, just like the first exam, 37 through 40. And uh, so that's the, uh, the, the, in terms of content. Let me uh, share with you the screen and show you where we left off last time. I think toward the end, I was rushing things and I thought we were making a mistake. And it turns out that's not a mistake because I immediately after the class was, uh, was over, yes, we were justified in calling this constants in front of this uh, size uh, that we suspect maybe they can depend on N. And that's what really threw me off because at the end, in the rush of things, BN is clearly independent of the integer N. Because from this integration, I will have an N pi canceling the N pi. And at the end of the day, there would be no n. So if we finished the calculation, we couldn't because we were running out of time. Actually, we went over time. Uh, we would have found the constant in here, the scaling factor to the uh, function psi in such a way that it is normalized. What I mean by that is that if I add up all of the probabilities from the negative infinity to positive infinity, granted that the particle itself is actually exists only between zero and f, okay? So that's why the integration at the end of the day was between zero and L, because the particle cannot exist outside of this region, that for psi is equal to zero on this region and psi is equal to zero the, through this region. That's why at the end of the day, the integration was just in the place where psi was not equal to zero. And uh, the summation was from zero to L. When we uh, take the complex conjugate of this function, all what we're doing actually is changing the signs of the i. So at the end of the day, we square this quantity. This is pure real. This is also has a potential to becoming a complex. So Bn, we treat it as real because it was in this case. Okay, general, in general, the constants in here, they, are, they may be complex numbers and just enough to compensate for whatever contributions from the other complex side. But in here, in this special case, in the case of the particle inside an infinite box, this term, when you take its complex conjugate, this is how it looks like. So if you take the complex conjugate of this number, it's exactly e to the plus i n squared pi squared h bar over lt. Now, when I multiply this number by that number, at the end of the day, we're going to get e to the power zero, which is one. So that's why it disappeared at the end of the day in the calculation. So there is no temporal, uh, no time basically in here involved in this, uh, in this expression. And at the end of the day, the expression just gave me this integral, which is, uh, that's why, what justifies at the end of the day that Bn need to be real, okay? Because there is no complex numbers anymore. It's all disappeared. And that is because we conjugated the function, the actual function big psi, because we may, we're making the distinction between the lowercase psi, which is just the space dependent of the part from the big psi, which has both x and t. So at the end of the day, the t parameter disappears on us, and we were left with this one. So again, let's see where we started from. At this point, we're assuming Schrodinger's equation is some sort of a given, in a sense that this is like a postulate for uh, for. Uh, for uh, quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, what we're saying in here is that a, a particle, the, the, the wave part of its behavior can be described using this equation, Schrodinger's equation, when it's in a potential U. 
Of course, we're dealing with the with the with the one dimensional uh, problem. That's why we only have x in here. T is just a parameter. Now, with the interpretation of Max Born, what this function because this is a complex equation, psi in it, and here must be a complex number. Psi has a real part and an imaginary part. Uh, well, the interpretation for that complex number resolves on Max Born's uh, basically a note of the fact that hey, this is similar to how we dealt with waves before, namely we were concerned only with the amplitude squared. That's what gives it a meaning. And that's what gives it intensity for all of those interference things. So in here, we're taking the amplitude squared. The reason why we call it amplitude is because a, a complex number can also be written, of course, as a real part and an imaginary part, but also as an amplitude times, uh, times a phase. And the phase of this complex number is expressed in here. So in other words, you could represent a, a complex number on a plane where the real part is the x-axis and the imaginary part is the y-axis. So this is your i, if you wish. And now you add the two numbers and you end up with what looks like a vector, basically, of co components, a real part plus i times the imaginary part contributions. So this is something that you have seen when you did complex numbers. Now, obviously, there is another way of interpreting this vector, its length, which is the amplitude itself, and also the phase, and the phase is the angle it makes with the, uh, with the y-axis, I mean, with the x-axis. So this is another way of expressing uh, the, the, the complex number. So using the amplitude and the phase, obviously the phase, when it takes the complex conjugate, will just cancel out because you just change the negative to plus i to the negative i. And at the end, this two cancels when you multiply the two numbers and you end up with psi squared. Okay, so this is the same thing. So this is the polar representation of complex numbers, whereas this one is a Cartesian representation of the same complex number. So any number z can be written as an imaginary real part plus i times imaginary, or also can be written as an amplitude times a phase, exponential i phi. I mean, this is another way of saying older expression that I used also last time around for complex numbers or any uh, uh, expression because e to the i phi also can be represented as the amplitude time cosine of the angle phi. And the imaginary part is the opposite to this angle phi, which is just the sine of phi times the uh, amplitude uh, psi. So this is actually the same thing as saying cosine of phi plus i sine of phi. So this is another way of looking at that Euler expression again that relates the exponential to the uh, trig functions cosine and sine. So again, we were, uh, we, we were interested in this specific problem at the end of the day, because it's the easiest problem that we can think of, and that is a particle in a box. And a particle in a box has basically is free to move inside only a, a container of specific width L in this case, okay? So what we're saying in here is that the wave function must vanish at the ends. Now, there is a problem with the solution. I will tell you exactly what that problem is, okay? But at the end of the day, we impose the, uh, the fact that it's free. That means that, first of all, we had to write the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, Schrodinger's equation in the case of, uh, of uh, stationary states. What I mean by that is that we changed, we separated the variables x and t into a, a, a small psi of x. And uh, the behavior with respect to time is just a cosine and a sine. So remember that this is Euler expression. This is a cosine and a sine. So it's like a wavy thing in terms of time. And the behavior in terms of the uh, spatial time can be any function you can think of. It turns out also to be a cosine and sine function in this case, trig function. So again, we uh, went through the, for, this is how the function look like now, I mean, the equation look like now for the case of uh, the time independent. There is no time in here. And so the derivatives become just straight derivatives. So this is the time independent Schrodinger equation that we were interested in studying for the case of the infinite well or a particle in a box, okay? It has the same, same, same thing in here. It's like a well. That has an, an infinite, uh, uh, an infinite uh, depth. So this is called also the infinite well problem. Is 
like a particle that is trapped inside a well that has no bottom, basically. Okay? Because you're looking at it from the top in here. Otherwise, it's a particle from our vantage point, if we're sitting in here, that is trapped in a box that has infinite height. So the potential in here is infinite, so the particle cannot go outside. It's trapped inside. So we impose the boundary conditions on, first of all, we had to solve this equation, and this is no different than equation that you have seen for the harmonic oscillator a long time ago. That's why cosine and sine function are good solutions to this. And we impose the boundary conditions, and this is where the problem is actually. The boundary conditions, we impose them on the function side. We should really impose them on the function also d psi with respect to x at x equals equal to zero must be continuous, whatever it is on the other side. And also the same derivative at x equals to zero, I'm sorry, and also at x equals to L. So those are two additional conditions. The solutions we found doesn't, do not satisfy these boundary conditions. And the reason why we have to have both the function itself and its derivative also continuous everywhere is because this differential equation, this equation gives you the second derivative already. Gives you this second derivative already. So if the fact that this equation knows about the second derivative, the first derivative must exist first and be continuous. And for the first derivative to exist and be continuous, also the function itself must exist and be continuous. So we impose a condition on the function itself being continuous, and that's fine. This solution itself is not continuous for the derivative. So there is a problem with the solution. In other words, the solution you find is not exactly a, 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 an exact solution to Schrodinger's equation in this form. But that's the best we can do, actually. That is the solution that we have in here. It is discontinuous at the boundaries, okay? So that is really part of the problem that we're facing. Other than that, we impose a condition at psi equals to zero. So that means that we have a cosine of zero, which is one times a, plus b times sine of zero, which is zero. So we have a plus zero equals to zero. That immediately tells me that a must be zero. So the function a or the parameter a is zero all the time for this geometry that we chose. Now, we do the same thing for L. We impose a condition that size of L is equal to zero. And that gives me B times sine of whatever that term is, instead we replace X by L equals to zero. Now I cannot say B equal to zero because we have two possibilities. Either B equal to zero or this entire sign is zero. If I say b equal to zero and a is already equal to zero, then we don't have a solution. I don't have a particle. Because if psi is always zero, then the probability, which is psi squared integrated from zero to L, from negative infinity to positive infinity, is going to be zero. So I really don't have a particle that. And we know we have a particle. We started with the assumption that we have a particle that sits in a well. So uh, I want to see. Hold on. Oh, okay, good. We have more people who joined us because I researched it. So the point in here is I cannot have in the same time both A and B equal to zero. I can have one of them, which is fine, which what we did, but I cannot really have both of them to be zero. So this is an excluded condition. The second possibility is the sign itself is zero. The sign itself is zero if its argument is multiples of pi. Sine of zero is zero, sine of pi is zero for 180 degrees, sine of 360 degrees is zero, and so on and so forth. And uh, that leaves me then with the uh, condition that this must be zero. And this is how we get our energy to be quantized. Because if I solve this for the energy, because this term has an energy term in it, then the energy depends on that integer n that makes the boundary condition true. That makes this boundary condition true. So where did the energy quantization come from? It came from the boundary conditions that we impose on the particle not to leave this box contained in it. So the energy now is quantized because we don't have a counterpart in, in classical mechanics. Classical mechanics, the, ener the, the particle can have, in can have energy it wants as long as it's contained in that. It's continuous value. And here it's a discrete. It comes in increments of n. N cannot be zero again, because if N equal to zero, we're back into the same problem of the particle does not exist, because if N is equal to zero, size of zero, because it has a sign of N pi, this is a solution in general. So if N is equal to zero, we're back to the same problem. 
because size zero and the particle doesn't exist in, anymore. So n cannot be equal to zero. And by symmetry, because if n is even or odd, it's counting the same state really, because if I change from n being positive or n being negative, I will absorb that sign into the definition of the n, that's all, because it's going to flip back and forth. So we're going to take only one of them because that's really counting the same same thing with the two different the two different signs, that's all. So that accounts for the same particle, really. So, or the same state of the particle, I should say. So uh, n can vary from one, two, three, four, five, whatever you want to do it. And the energy levels will go from n to three, four. So those negative values are really uh, meaningless in this case because they can be absorbed in the definition of the n. So how do we find this coefficients? Well, the way we find these coefficients is that we know the particle exists somewhere. That means the probability of finding the particle somewhere is 100%. That's what that means. And since the square of this function or the amplitude square of this function uh, is really the probability density, all I have to do is sum that probability density from negative infinity to positive infinity and impose on it the condition of being exactly 100%. Having said that, of course, the function is zero between negative infinity and zero, and between L and positive infinity is zero. So the integration between zero and L of this whole thing, and again, I already stated the fact that the actual psi that we need to impose a condition on is not the lowercase psi, is not that the time independent wave function. We need to have it on the full fledged function and by replacing the value of E that we found in here. But that, doesn't matter because of the fact that when you take the complex conjugate of this complex number, all you're doing is just multiplying this number by itself and it's going to be one. If you don't like the Euler expression and you think that this is actually should be cosine of this number, whichever it is, n squared pi squared h bar over L. So n squared pi squared h bar over L times t, plus i times the sine of the same stuff. Well, it's complex conjugate is gonna be cos cosine of the same stuff minus, because the i flips sine, sine of the uh, same stuff. Now, when you multiply a complex number by its complex conjugate, cosine times cosine, that's cos squared. i times sine times minus i times sine. i times minus i, that's plus i, uh, plus one, I'm sorry because i squared is negative one times negative, that's plus one, and sine squared, cos squared plus sine squared, and then you have the, the cross product terms. You have a negative i times a sine cosine, and uh, a cosine times i, so these two cancel. So the only thing you'll be left with a cos squared plus one squared, uh, plus sine squared, which is one all the time. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. If you write it in the Euler form, which is gonna be exponential of zero, and that gives you one, or you write it in the complex, I mean, you write it in the, uh, in the uh, trig form, you're gonna end up with one too because cos squared plus sin squared is one. So the time part of it drops. So in other words, this whole thing does not depend on time. So we could have as well just taken this complex conjugate of this number. And I warned in the beginning that this B might be a complex number because in general, this function psi itself is complex. So it's, um, coefficient in general could be a complex number. But because of the fact that we ended up with a real equation at the end of the day, there is no need for it to add a phase to it because it's really not there. So the phase is zero. Well, now it's just a matter of integrating this expression. There is an identity that you have seen from trig functions, cos squared minus sin squared is equal to cosine twice the angle. You can replace the cos by so that same expression, y minus sine squared, so it's gonna be one minus two sine squared is equal to cos two y. And then that means the cos squared is just equal to one minus cosine twice the angle divided by two. When you integrate from zero to n pi, because when we did the variable change in here, because we have n pi x over L, so we wanted to get rid of all of that and call it y. So that means that dx becomes L over n pi and the boundaries of integration were from zero to L. So when X was zero, Y is zero. And when X is equal to L, that means the upper bound is N pi. 
for this integral. And we're taking it for any function psi n because we're trying to normalize them one at a time. And, uh, and there are a bunch of them. There's an infinite functions now. We, we were hoping to find one and we found one that depends on uh, n. And n can be one, two, three, four, whatever number you like, okay? So uh, at the end of the day, we integrate it. And the integral of a cosine is just a sine. Negative cosine is a sine actually. And divide by this argument. So it's gonna be sine of two y over uh, four. Well, at y equals to zero, this is zero because sine of zero is zero. At y equals to n pi, the sine of two n pi is also zero. So this term drops when we integrate. And you're left with the integral of one half. And the integral of one half is one half times y bound between zero and n pi. Of course, this is equal to n pi over two. Okay, here is the deal. Then what this says is this integral itself is n pi over two. So bn squared times, don't forget we have an L over n pi to begin with that we took it from the uh, change of variable times the result of the integration, which is n pi over two is equal to one. Cancel the n pi and n pi. So the b's do not really depend on n. That's what I was really at the end of the day, we were tired. I was tired actually, and I thought this might be a mistake, but it is not. So the b's then in general, they are independent of n, and they are inversely proportional to the square root of the width of the well. Okay. And that's necessary because if I integrate these functions, I'm going to square them. So I'll be living with one over L and I'm integrating from zero to L. So I'm going to pick up another L from this DX. And that is enough to give me the function being normalized. Because this is a probability density and the probability density, the function itself Remember, the probability of finding something between zero, between, I'm sorry, x and x plus dx is proportional to this quantity. So this is how it explained the probability of finding a particle in a region. So this is not even writing it as a function. So this is the probability, probability of finding a particle between, this is the interpretation of Max Born that we're going with, uh, x and x plus dx. Here is a problem. This is a length. This better be one over length because the probability is a number, is a percentage. 20%, 5%. 27.3%, whatever that number is, 99.9%, whatever that number is, it's a number. So if this is length, which is true, this better be one over length. So the coefficients need to be, because this is psi squared, remember? So that means psi itself better be of one over square root of L. And that's exactly what we found. So the solutions for this psi n look like this. We have a bunch of them. This is the time independent psi n they're equal to the square root of two over L times the sine of, let me get the uh, correct coefficients in here of that spatial, it's n pi X over L, n pi X over L, where n can be any number, one, two, three, and so on and so forth, excluding zero. Zero will not give me a solution. Uh, the other thing on whole, in here that we found is that the energy that corresponds to each and one of these n's is proportional to the number n squared times E naught times some fundamental unit of energy, which is equal to, I mean, this might be confusing, this E naught. So I'm going to call it E F fundamental because it might give you the assumption that this is E times, uh, uh, if you wish, for n equals to zero. And there is no n equals to zero in the solution. So I'm going to change the name. The fundamental grain of energy, the fundamental unit of energy is this coefficient, pi squared h bar squared over 2 ml squared, pi squared 
each bar squared over two ml squared. Okay, here is a trick. Remember, you have pi squared times h bar squared. Remember that two pi, h bar is the same as h. So pi squared h bar squared is really h squared over four. So I can write this same expression as h squared over eight ml squared. So this is another way of finding it in the literature also for this particular problem. So this is the solution to a particle that is trapped inside an infinite well. Solution of Schrodinger's equation for a particle trapped inside an infinite well or in a box, same thing. I mean, it doesn't make sense to call it a box now, but later on when we deal with it in 3D, we're gonna call it a box, a real physical box, okay? like a box and you have a particle inside of it. Does this solution make sense to you guys on how we arrive to it? Yes. Yes. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Okay. Very good. So the point being in here is, and it's a very important point, we found the quantized solutions for the energy. They are dependent on that parameter n squared times this fundamental little grain of energy. And uh, that number n is an integer that can vary from one, two, three, four, and so on and so forth. And the solutions themselves, they depend on that n. Where did this quantization arise from? It arises from imposing a condition, the boundary conditions. Quantization. That's why they call it quantum mechanics. It's because of this n, that integer, integers that keep on popping, popping up everywhere. everywhere. Quantization in this case is arises from, did I put it wrong? From imposing the boundary conditions. That is a key. It's not from anything else. The only time N appeared on us is when we impose that, those conditions at x equals to zero and at x equals to L. Another way of rewriting this problem, and it's a setup for another problem that we're gonna tackle immediately, is to uh, look at this well in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in a symmetrical fashion. Let me explain. We integrated, we said the particle is trapped between zero and L. Instead, we could have said between negative L over two and positive L over two. It's the same thing and shift the origin to the middle. So the origin is zero in here and the solution then the particle will be trapped in the same well as before. Okay. And we should arrive at the same conclusion. The energy levels actually are going to be the same thing. The energy in this case are going to be N squared times that grain of energy, fundamental energy that we found in there. And the solutions are going to be more or less the same thing. Uh, except now, I have two conditions. I have to go back into the original expression for the solution, which is A times cosine and B times sine, and impose that at X equals to negative L over two, this whole term is zero. And at X equals to positive L over two, this whole term is zero. And in that case, I will not have either A or B equal to zero. Both of them will appear and I will have two kinds of solutions, actually. I will have the N which is even and the N which is odd, okay? From this same N, okay? The even solutions would look like cosines. So the first one is gonna be a cosine, actually. The second next even solution is going to be a cosine. What is it? Uh, a true cosine in this case. So it's gonna be here. B 
try to draw it. It has to be zero in the boundaries. It cannot be open, okay? And so on and so forth. So these are the even solutions, meaning that they, are, they match from one side to the side. The cosine will do that. The sine will be, let me change the color in here just to uh, show the distinction between the two. The sine is for the odd numbers of n. And the next mode will have basically two wavelengths and so on and so forth. So those are the different solutions in the case of, it's the same problem, except it appears to be ordered separating between the ends because in here, in our original solution, when we took this kind of geometry, we ended up with a, uh, with a uh, N that could be anything that you like, as long as it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. But if we change the boundaries, it's going to give me the same solution, the same setup, except it's going to break down the one and the three and the five and the seven and all of this odd numbers into cosine multiplets, because that's a function that is even. I'm sorry, I did it the other way around. It's going to be the sine, actually, because that's the function that is odd. And then uh, for the even solutions, the two, the four, and the, uh, the six and the eight are going to be your, 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 uh, your, uh, cosine functions. The point being in here is that the solution would look slightly different. Why am I saying this? Is because for our pur purpose of this problem, the next problem, which is a finite web. The math is a little bit more complicated. So I'm going to go briefly in describing the solution for it. For a finite web, it works better actually to have the second geometry I just mentioned in here. So now the height of the well is not infinite. So it's actually U not. Remember earlier, we had infinity in here. And the particle, again, it's better to be treated in this well, where there is a perfect symmetry in here at x equals to zero, okay? So the particle now, if it has, Remember, let's rewrite the equation first of all, showing your equation. So u as of x, as a function of x, is equal to u naught when x is less than negative l over two. And it's equal to zero when x is greater than negative l over two, but less than l over two. And it's equal to, again, u naught when x is greater than l over two. So this is a particle that is in a finite well. Okay, then Schrodinger's equation will split itself according to these things. So we have, remember, I can write Schrodinger's equation and I'm going to write it in the, uh, of course, the time independent because we already separated the variables. So we're going to deal with this equation in this form, this one, okay? So, let me go back in here. So we have minus h bar squared minus h bar over 2m times the second derivative of the function psi with respect to x plus the potential, plus this potential itself. So this equation will have uh, several forms for it, plus u, sorry, capital U, I didn't mean to write, capital U sub x times psi is equal to e psi. This is Schrodinger's equation without the parameter t because the parameter t has already been used to pull that e from it, okay? Let's see. So the parameter e was already used to pull the e from this exponential that at the end cancels. So this is the time independent Schrodinger's equation and I need to write it. Obviously, this form of this equation can have several forms, okay? Let me explain them. For x greater than absolute value of L over two, it doesn't matter which one, for x on this side or x on that side. This equation, this u is zero. So the equation looks like minus h bar squared over two m times the second derivative of psi with respect to x is equal to simply e psi. In other words, second derivative of psi with respect to x is simply equal to minus two m e over h bar squared times psi. That's exactly how this function look like. 
However, when x is less than the absolute value of L over two, meaning it's greater than negative L over two and less than, uh, let me write it, x less than L over two, but greater than negative L over two. Okay, in that region, the same equation now look like minus h bar squared over two m times the second derivative of psi with respect to x plus u naught, which is constant now, times psi is equal to e times psi. Now we're going to move this term by itself to the other side and move the e to the other side. And uh, basically we're going to end up with an identical equation. And this equation looks like, except that the e now will have a shifted value for u. So we're going to have the second derivative of psi with respect to x is equal to minus. I will tell you what the value of writing the minus in there. So it's going to be uh, 2m times e minus u naught divided by h bar squared times psi. So this is the equation on how it looks like inside the well. And this is the equation of how it looks like outside of the well. I'm going to define two variables, kappa and k. So at this point, they don't have a meaning, OK? So k, by definition, is equal to, remember, this is 1 over distance squared. The second derivative drops 1 over distance squared because you have dx squared in the denominator. So that's a length squared. So this quantity must be also of a length, 1 over length squared. And 1 over length is actually the wave number that we're uh, dealing with. So if I'm going to define k as the square root of 2me over h bar squared. So this behaves like a wave number for a free particle. That's exactly what we're dealing with. As a, if, if the particle was free, this is what's going to happen. And inside, there is no potential. So it's like a free particle inside, OK? That's why we're defining it as if it's a wave number, because we don't really have waves yet. Until we have them, then we're going to deal with wave numbers. Outside, this looks like also in 1 over length squared 2. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, this is the inside. I'm sorry. This is the inside. This is the outside. OK? But this is for a free particle. For the inside, it looks like it also has a wave number, which I'm going to write as a letter kappa. And kappa is exactly the same thing, except that this quantity is inside. So kappa is going to be square root of 2m times e minus u naught. Are you guys familiar with the Greek letter kappa? And here, just to not confuse it with letter k. But it's also the same thing. It's 1 over distance squared. Make sense? I mean, right now, kappa is actually 1 over distance, 1 over meter, I'm sorry. And this is 1 over meter. And you can verify it. I mean, mass is kilogram. Uh, energy is joules divided by joule squared. And joule squared is joule times joule. And joule is a kilogram meter per second squared times a meter. This is force times displacement times second squared. Don't forget you have a second squared in here because each bar, each and every one of them has an H. It's a joule squared times second squared. The second squared and the second squared cancel. Uh, the joule and the joule cancel and the kilogram and the kilogram cancel, and you left with one over square root of meter squared, which is one over meter. And the same thing is true in here also. So dimensionally, this is a one over meter, as it should be, under the square root, of course. I mean, if you take it without the square root, it's going to be one over meter squared. Makes sense, at least dimensionally, that we're not talking nonsense in terms of length and all of that? Yeah, it does. Okay, very good. So uh, basically, at the end of the day, these are the two equations we're dealing with inside the well, if the energy is somewhere in here of the particle, if the energy E is less than U naught, we have a problem. If the energy is less than U naught, this definition of kappa is actually not good. I'm sorry. Uh, I have to, let me, let me rephrase the U naught, uh, kappa, okay? Kappa is gonna be a length at the end of the day, but I, we need to make the assumption that the, because if the energy is more than u naught, the particle can be anywhere. The particle is free to move outside of the well. The whole point of this exercise is actually when the energy is less than u naught. And if it's less than u naught, this is a complex number. So I'm going to define uh, u naught, actually, a kappa is slightly different. 
So what is that, a ratio of theta? So actually here, we need to define it a little bit differently. So this becomes u naught, and this becomes E, because I'm going to take the case where the energy E is not sufficient enough for it to leave the well. Okay, so this is the assumption that we should have started with, that the energy, you don't have enough energy, because it's a particle that is still inside the well. For that, the, its energy should not be higher than u naught, because if it's bigger than u naught, then we're back to the particle that is free to be anywhere in that case in here, probably is going to, this is no big deal then for it. Okay, so this is actually how kappa is defined. Okay, kappa is defined as square root, because we're assuming that E is less than u naught. For that, for this square root then to make sense, we really have to make u naught minus e and not the other way around. Did everybody make that correction? For kappa? Yep, just it right now. Very good. What everybody else, is you guys following so far? Did you catch where the issue was going to arise if we kept that definition for kappa? You guys are still here? Okay, somebody chatted. Okay, Natasha is awake. Very good. Thank you very much, Natasha. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. I know that you guys are following, so make sure that you guys, uh, 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 you write these things and basically go through the steps because sometimes it's kind of, uh, I mean, if you're not careful enough, and this is exactly what happened to me here, you could get into trouble very quickly, okay? So the energy really needs to be somewhere in here to see that the particle is inside the, uh, the, uh, the well. So its energy is less than u naught. And if, that case, and if that's the case, then kappa doesn't make sense to have it an imaginary thing in here. I know we're saying that we're dealing with complex numbers and things like that, but hey, uh, at the end of the day, we're going to do measurements, okay? So this is kappa also has the same dimensions, which is the one over length, because this is still, the difference between energy is still in general. Anyway, uh, here is the deal though. This is almost like a particle in the well, especially if u naught goes to infinity, in an infinite well. But if u naught is not exactly infinite, then we have another situation. If we follow the same rationale as we did before, and I'm not gonna do it because it's long and tedious, unless you're going to be really majoring in physics or chemistry, you will see that this calculation can get very complicated, but I'm gonna give you what you're going to find, okay? You're going to find again a cosine and a sine in this solution. You're going to impose that it's a cosine and a sine because of the fact that this is the solution. This is the equation. This is the harmonic oscillator. And this will for sure have solutions of the form. Let me change the color. We'll for sure have solutions in this case of the form A times a cosine of this number, which we just called it K, by the way, of this Kx plus uh, b times sine of kx, where k is the way we defined it in the bottom. This is k, okay? However, here, this difference is positive. Remember, e is less than u naught. So really, I should write this equation now as a second derivative of psi with respect to x as simply equal to a positive 2m times uh, u naught minus e divided by h bar squared times psi. And this is exactly what kappa is, squared, of course. So this is kappa squared psi. The solution for this equation is exponential. The solution for this equation it blows up in the sense that you have two psi's. Psi could be something times the exponential of minus kappa x plus something times exponential of negative kappa x. Sure enough, if you sub for this one, plus. Uh, so let's say constant C1 in here and constant C2 in here. Okay. If you take the first derivative, you're gonna drop a negative kappa in here and a positive kappa in here, okay? For these two solutions. Uh, if you take the second derivative, you're gonna drop another negative kappa, multiplying by the negative kappa is gonna be kappa squared. So the first derivative will drop a kappa, 
times the exponential doesn't change, this will drop a positive kappa. The second derivative will drop another negative kappa times the negative kappa that exists before. And then here is going to drop a kappa times a negative uh, positive kappa. So this is going to be a kappa squared. And this is going to be kappa squared. You take it out, and this term doesn't change. So this is indeed a solution just by substitution. Now, here is the trouble with the solution. When x goes to negative infinity on this side of the well, when x goes to negative infinity, this exponential blows up because exponential of negative negative infinity is infinity. So on this side, I'm going to choose C1 to be exactly equal to zero. So I'm going to say on this side, the solution should be then psi on this side, on the negative side, if you want to call it that way, of x must be some constant c times exponential of a positive kappa x. So when x goes to negative infinity, this goes to zero. And the reason why we worry about infinity is because I need to do at the end of the day that integral, remember, for the normalization and an integral of infinity is going to blow up. So we cannot have a wave function that is going to go to infinity. That is impossible. Because at the end, remember, the interpretation is psi squared dx must be 1. From negative infinity to positive infinity, the entire quantity has to be 1. So if it goes to infinity on this side with this solution, the only way for it to be acceptable is to make that coefficient exactly 0. Then we're fine. Then this exponential is going to be fine. On the positive side, though, you have the problem reversed. When x goes to positive infinity, this blows up. The positive kappa x blows up, but the negative kappa x will go to zero. So on this side, now we're going to say the solution must be on the positive side of the well, the solution is going to be exponential of a d times exponential of minus kappa x. So here is the deal. We have three solutions then. I'm not going to do the whole math, but I'm going to just show you basically what's going on. So on the negative side, so psi of x, then here is the solution. On one side, it's c times exponential of a positive kappa x. On between, it's a times cosine of kx plus b times kx, sine of kx. This is for x less than negative l over 2. This is for x greater than negative l over 2, but less than l over 2. And this, at the end, is exponential of x uh, minus kappa x, where x is greater than l over 2. I didn't say equal to. I didn't say equal to. I didn't say equal to. I just said basically straight inequalities. So what happened at the boundaries? They must match. We have to have a match. We have to say that c at negative kappa over two, uh, negative, negative kappa, at x equals to negative l over two must be the same from this side and this side. And this is what they match. So exponential of negative l over two must be equal to a times cosine on negative k l over two, which is positive the same. Cos, and, uh, cos function is an even function, plus b times the sine of k times negative l over 2. And the same thing at x equals to l over 2, we're going to have d exponential of negative kappa l over 2. It's going to be the same because x is l over 2. But you have a negative to begin with. This is kappa times l over 2 or times negative l over 2. And that's why you ended up with a negative in here. So it's going to be a times cosine of k times l over 2 plus b times sine of k l over 2. That is not the end of it, though. You have to take the derivatives in here with respect to x and impose the conditions also on the derivatives. So this is going to be a well-behaved solution. This is going to be a real solution. And that is because the original one is really an idealized solution. That's why we couldn't really impose the derivative. That has to be continuous function, too, for the derivative. But now you still have to do the derivatives. 
both at these two points. Okay. Once you do that, and I'm not saying you do, I'm not saying I'm going to do it because it's going to lead us to something called transcendental functions or so equations. Okay. This is how the solution should look like. They're going to match two if, uh, functions. On one side, it's going to be tangent, and the other side is going to be some square root of some number in here divided by some constant in here that you're imposing the condition on. This is dimensionless uh, version of the energy, that's all. It's equal to uh, the tangent of some dimensional number times the, the dimensionless number, which is really a, a scaled also uh, energy. So here is how the solution for the square root would look like, okay? And the tangent itself will be from zero to two pi over two, will be like this and from here and in here. Depending on the level, depending on the, sh the depth of the well, how deep the well is, you're going to end up with one solution or two solutions or three solutions, or if it's very deep, actually you'll end up with more. I'm sorry, did I draw all of them? They should be here, negative pi over two, pi over two, and so on and so forth. One of them is for the odd numbers, even numbers for n, odd numbers, and so on and so forth. So you could end up with, depending on how shallow or how deep the well is, you could end up with one. If it's very shallow, you're going to have one. So if this well is very, very shallow, that means that the energy U naught is very, very close from, uh, uh, from zero, then in this case, you're going to end up with only one solution. So you're, no matter what, you're going to have one solution. If it's deeper, then in that case, deeper compared to what? Remember that E fundamental? That is the comparative term in here. To the first energy level for an infinite well. That is the comparable, comparable term in here. So compared to that term, you're going to end up with probably two quantized values of the energy, or three, or four, or five, or six, or seven. So the deeper the well, the more energy levels you're going to do, and the more they're going to look like an infinite well. So in other words, if you take it infinitely deep, that means you take you not very, very far up in the, in the, in the scale, you're going to reproduce the same problem from before. I know I did not do the math. And because it involves a really lengthy calculation, it's really not worth it, honestly. But the point being in here is the quantization arise from the boundary conditions again. That is the big deal in here for the finite web. And this is a more of a typical problem that you're going to encounter. At least in real life, I don't mean in this class. In this class, probably we're going to just sketch it conceptually. Make sense conceptually, at least. Yes, no, maybe. Yeah, yes, so could you just explain on the graph about the odd and even one more time? Okay, you'll end up with two sides of the same equation. That's why we call them transcendental equations because of the fact that they are involving two kinds of different functions. On one side, you have a trig tangent function and for the other one, actually, there is a cotangent function for the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the even ones. And the other side, it's actually a square root of some function. And you're going to match them to see where they intersect. So you're finding the solutions numerically. So you draw one graph, which is the one side of the equation, which looks like, like this. So this is the one. And on the other side, it's just the tangent or the cotangent drawn between 0 and pi over 2 and between pi over 2 and pi, and between pi and 3 pi over 2, and so on and so forth. Depending on how well this square root on the other side, you're going to end up with different solutions. If it is extended, you're going to always find one for between 0 and pi over 2, and then potentially another one between 0, between pi over 2 and pi, and then another one between probably, if it extends well enough, you're going to find a third one, and so on and so forth. So what I'm saying in here is how much you're going to extend this square root depends on the depth of the well. If the well is very deep, this square root will end up extending a long way and capturing more and more of those intersections. If it's shallow, 
super shallow well, you will only have one between zero and pi over two, end of the story. So you, no matter what, you're going to find one. I'm not trying to honestly, I'm not trying to get into the depth of the math for it, because we require that to have a numerical calculator with us and I have Mathematica, I don't have it open, but we could potentially get into that, okay? But the point being in here is, and this is the essential two points that you need to take from this discussion. First of all, it's still the same boundary conditions, albeit now they are a little bit complicated that involve both the function itself and its derivative and the function itself is complicated, okay? It has several definitions. It's exponential on one side and costs and, and, and uh, trig functions on one side and the other. That is because the energy level is just high enough to make that this one is oscillating for a wave function and this one is high enough actually for it to be just an exponential decay. So in other words, this is how the solution really would look like. For, for, for an infinite where, remember, the first solution was a sine of pi x over L. This is for n equals to uh, one. And this solution, of course, when I write it this way, we wrote it from zero to L, okay? From zero to L, it was zero here and it was zero here and it's just half a wavelength, okay? For this case, we're, we're, we're drawing it actually with a different definition from negative L over two to positive L. It's the same wave function. The point being in here, it vanishes immediately here at the boundaries. Now it doesn't vanish at the boundaries. It has actually developed a tail and that tail is that exponential decay. So in here, right now, the solution would look like this. And it's decaying exponentially because when X is negative, this goes to zero quickly. And the same thing when X goes to a positive, this has developed a tail and also goes in the forbidden region, region Classically, a particle in classical physics, if you throw a, a tennis ball in here and bounce it, no matter how much energy, as long as its energy is not higher than the, the height of the well, then it's going to be trapped. It's not going to be end up in, the, in this forbidden region or this forbidden region. So this is classically forbidden, but a wave function has this exponential tail that develops on both sides. In the forbidden region that was completely forbidden in classical mechanics, this one is somehow this wave function that was a sine and a cosine before now has an exponential tail that decays exponentially. So this is the point that I'm trying to get into it. And the math for it is a little bit nasty and involves this continuity functions for the function itself and its derivatives. And once you find it, you're going to go through this, this thing. I promise if you're going to major in physics, you're going to see this equation when you take advanced quantum mechanics. If you don't, then just understand the following. That is the boundary conditions that came up with the quantization. In other words, it's the boundary conditions that gave us the discrete values of these energies. And you will always have one, no matter how shallow the well is, okay? And the second thing in here, and I did not really give the formula for it because it still involves some uh, 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 values from this so solving this equation, but it's actually going to be slightly less than the energies that we found. They're all scaled with that E fundamental. Remember that's uh, H over H bar squared over eight ML squared or N or pi squared H bar squared over two ML squared, whichever way you write it, but slightly off than the one for the infinite well. And the biggest deal now that we see this tail developing from both ends, that the, the wave function penetrates in otherwise forbidden regions in classical mechanics. Make sense? Yes. Okay. How about the rest of you guys? Somewhat, maybe? Okay, very good. Thank you very much, Natasha. At least I have you with me here. I don't know about the others. Okay. Listen, uh, there is another uh, problem actually. If we're going to take the well and flip it backward, and now we're going to have a wall. Particle encountering a wall. Okay, so this is, we're still taking the well now, we're going to flip it backward and make it into a wall. I'm going to, from the get-go, assume that the wall has a finite uh, width. So. 
Here is a particle. This is a free particle, by the way. It's a free particle, but all of a sudden it encounters a well, I mean a wall. I'm getting my A and E confused now. I'm going to have it of finite height. I cannot draw straight lines for some reason in here with this pen. So here is the height of the well is U naught. The width of the well is L. So from zero to L, the particle is coming in here. It has a wave function. Remember, a free particle is just those cosines and sines that we discussed before. It encounters the well. And I'm going from the get-go, assume that it has energy E less than U naught. OK? So on one side, it's free to exist. This is the incoming particle. So I'm going to assume that it's incoming from here. So it's going to have a wave function. That is a sine and cosine. And when it encounters the well, it's going to have a problem. OK, so I'm going to focus on the intensity. So I'm going to draw it positive, OK, because it's much easier to explain in DK in terms of positive. So at this point, it's a forbidden region. Classical particles will not go through a well, OK? Let's throw a ball against it, uh, the, the, the wall. is going to bounce back. In, 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 in quantum mechanics, again, because of that tail that develops, it will have a tail. And that tail, if it's long enough, it's going to extend, it's going to decay until it reaches the forbidden region. So part of the wave is going to be reflected. Okay. Part of the wave is going to be reflected. So I'm going to draw the reflection in here. Where is that? Oh man. It's going to be reflected, I'm sorry. With a less amplitude. So I want to draw the so let's draw the reflection with another coefficient in here. So part of the wave is going to be reflected back. Obviously, part of energy is lost through this transmission in here. Okay? And then the other part is going to show up on the other side, transmitted, albeit with a smaller and smaller amplitude, depending on how much energy E it has versus U naught. If it has high enough energy close from U naught, it will have a better chance of having transmitted version of it. So basically penetrating the wall and going through the other side. If it has less energy, it has less chance of being transmitted on the other side, which will be mainly reflected, okay? So this is a part, this is actually called tunneling. This is only quantum mechanical behavior, tunneling. So classical particle will never tunnel. Think of, for example, the, uh, the riding the roller coaster as you're going from a high to a point to a low. So you have enough kinetic energy as you hit this point that you're going to lose enough kinetic energy. And at the end of the day, you're going to overcome this, this barrier and come back and here and so on and so forth. So as long as you start with a higher kinetic energy, you can always make it on the roller coaster. There is no problem with it because your initial energy is mg this much height. So when you reach this point in here, all of that energy mg times this difference height has been converted into mv squared. Now we have enough energy to overcome the second height in here, h1, because of that fact. But this is what's going on in quantum mechanical systems. If you take the same picture, a particle that starts with, let's say, for example, with this much potential energy, and if you have a well that looks like this, for example, it has the potential to make it in here from here, because if you do the same analysis in here, one half of mv squared is equal to mgh, but this h is higher. h2 now is higher than this height. So how does it make it? How come it's going to end up in here? For that, it looks like, if I write the conservation of energy, E equal to one half of mv squared times the potential energy, it looks like, which is one half of mv squared equals to, that the kinetic energy in this case term, which is the difference between E times minus U. Well, look, 
the entire U, I mean E, is just this much. That's it. That's all of the, the entire uh, uh, energy. And the potential energy in this point is clearly greater than E. So it looks like the kinetic energy is negative in this region. So Ke looks like it's negative in that position. So as if it has a negative kinetic energy. This is forbidden in classical mechanics because you cannot have one half of mv squared negative. Yet this is what we're trying to argue in here. In quantum mechanics, that argument flips backward. The, the particle in here, it has a wave number k. It comes in. Uh, dk is according to kappa. What is my drawing plan? dk is a great kappa in this region. I remember k has to do with the kinetic energy, I mean, with the 2me over h bar square. And kappa, I just defined it as, because remember, u naught is less, is greater than e. So it's going to be square root of 2m times u naught minus e divided by h bar squared. So it's going to decay at that rate, and then it's going to end up on the other side with another wave number, k prime, OK? k prime is equal to going to be square root of 2 m e prime divided by that number. If I take, and I'm not doing the math, OK? If I take, because again, I will have to write the psi function in here, which is a combination of a cosine and a sine. I have to write the function in here, so again, this is how this solution would look like a times cosine of kx plus b times sine of kx. Here is going to be a c times exponential of kappa x plus b d times exponential of negative kappa x. And in here is going to be the new wave number in here that is going to be uh, uh, potentially another function in here, which is going to be e uh, or a prime times cosine of k prime and so on and so forth. The point being in here is that I have to impose a condition of continuity on the wave function itself here and the wave function itself here. So I have to match the coefficients, number one. Number two, I have to continue also the derivatives because this whole wave equation is continuous everywhere for the second derivative. So it exists for the second derivative. So the function itself, psi, has to be continuous and the function d psi over dx also has to be continuous. So I have to impose the conditions. Then I take the amplitude of the transmitted wave. So this is the transmitted over the incoming and define the probability of transmission in this case. So T is the transmission probability What are the chances of this particle basically being on the other side of the web? I mean, the wall. It's not well, wall, okay? What are the chances of having it on the other side? And it turns out to be given by G times exponential. I'm gonna give you the results, two kappa times L, where L is the width of that wall. Okay, and G is actually have to do with the ratio of the energies. The G is a factor of 16. Don't ask where the 16 is coming from because it's going to require a lot of calculations for the transmission basically coefficients times one minus the ratio of the energies again. Okay, so this is the remember kappa. I just gave the definition for it. It's square root of two times uh, u naught minus e and divided by h bar squared. Okay. h bar squared is under the square root, by the way. Okay. I know uh, some other textbooks, they will write it as 2m times u naught minus e under the square root divided by h bar. And it's the same thing. Okay. So, you have now, so this is the transmission probability. What are the chances of this particle being on the other side of the wall? You do the calculation. Here is where it goes wrong, and I have seen it in my exams, OK? Some of my students in the past, I forgot the two in here. And they will find a high transmission coefficient. Because remember, that two makes a big difference. It's squared. 
That's what that means, okay? Because this whole thing is the amplitude of the transmitted over the amplitude of the of the of the uh, of the incoming, and the amplitude has to do with the square of the wave function divided by this square. And yes, it has an exponential of minus k l in here, kappa kappa l in the coefficients where they meet because the exponential is just inside. This is kappa, not k. Okay. And this is kappa. Yeah, this is kappa. So. So it has to do with that exponential, but when you square it, you're going to pick up a two in there. Okay, so that is where the two is coming from. So this is how we uh, 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 find the uh, the coefficient, the pro transmission probability for this wave function. Now let me ask you a a, a uh, I mean you might think that all of this sounds good and great, but are what is useful for? This is at the heart of radioactive uh, material, radioactivity. Radioactivity is a phenomenon where, for example, doesn't matter what kind of uh, radioactivity, alpha particles or beta particles, we're going to get into them later on. Uh, the, the particle is trapped inside a well, inside of that wall, basically, and it's tried to leave. It doesn't leave. It doesn't have enough kinetic energy to leave the, the, the nucleus. But then, because of tunneling, because of this effect, the particle finds itself outside. Okay, and basically that's how radioactive, uh, radioactivity uh, happens. And this is the phenomenon behind which how we get our energy. So this is a purely quantum mechanical effect that should not exist if classical mechanics were correct. Yet it's responsible for a lot of phenomenon that we see in nature. So uh, this is. Yes, we're using the Wendy, we're making a lot of simplifications, but we're getting some, some, some headway, we're getting some answers in here. Okay. Sounds good, everybody? Yep, sounds good. Okay. So here is the next step, which is the last step of this chapter, and that is the harmonic oscillator. Okay. And the harmonic oscillator. Quantum harmonic oscillator. If you guys remember from your physics one physics oscillator, from your physics one, if you take a mass and attach to a spring, and the spring is attached to the wall, so you have K, you have M, and you do Newton's laws of motion, you'll find that MA, and this is a displacement, let's call it X naught, uh, uh, MA, which is M times the second derivative of X with respect to time is equal to the forces in this case, and it's only a force in here, it's just a restoring force, F, uh, uh, which is Hooke's law. Then uh, from here, you're going to find that this equation is of the form of the second derivative with respect to time is equal to minus omega squared, times x, where omega squared is equal to, uh, or omega itself is square root of k over m, where this k, not to be confused with the wave number, is actually the spring constant. OK? Make sense? From physics one? Yeah. OK. So. Uh, the solution for this one is just oscillatory solution. That means that X is some sort of a constant times cosine of omega T plus B times sine of cosine of omega T. And uh, obviously for this particular solution is gonna be a cosine because uh, at T equal to zero, the particle was released from rest, which means that its initial velocity is zero. And for that, if its initial velocity is zero, that means B is zero. Okay. When you take the derivative, the cosine becomes the sine becomes a cosine, and when you plug t in it to equal to zero, that means dx over dt. In this scenario, okay, at t equal to zero is zero, that leads immediately to b equals to zero, and the solution in this case is just going to be some amplitude, which is going to be x naught times cosine of omega t. You can verify that this is actually a solution to the equation by just plugging in the numbers in there. Of course, I for some reason I I drew it backward. 
because I start talking about mass and then spring and I put them on the <laughs> usually you put them on the other side, but hopefully you guys this is not confusing. Okay, typically you draw it this way. You have a mass, you have spring, and you have the wall, and you move it, you displace it to x naught in this case, and that's where the x is being positive. Okay. I drew it backward. Everything I started from the mass started talking about it this way. Okay. But that's hopefully not confusing for you guys to see that this is a solution for the equation in either case. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, very good. Then the kinetic the, the, the total energy of the system is simply equal to the one half of mv squared plus one half of uh, kx squared, the potential plus kinetic. The potential, the kinetic in this case is simple. Take the derivative of this term. The derivative of this term is just minus uh, x naught. Let's not square yet. Not minus x naught omega times sine of omega t, the whole thing squared times the mass, plus one half times k times x naught cosine omega t, the whole thing squared, okay? Well, uh, I will have a negative squared that's positive, x naught squared and x naught squared is going to come out. And I will have an omega squared times the sine squared, and I will have a k squared times theta uh, cosine squared, basically. So this is what we'll end up with, okay? E, so this is the total energy. The total energy is one half, and I have an x naught squared, which I'm going to take it, and I will be left with an m omega squared plus k times nothing, except, I'm sorry, I have a sine squared in here omega t, and it will be left over cosine squared of omega t times k. Yes? Sounds, sounds correct? X squared, square, x naught squared, I forgot to square this, x squared naught, because it's squared in here and squared in there. Correct, everybody? Did I make a mistake? For the energy, I know no, I think it looks good. Yeah, it looks good to me too. Yeah, because it's been a long time for you guys and probably for me too, for the uh, for the harmonic oscillator. Classical mechanics. This is all classical. Okay, we're not doing anything. This is all physics one. So here is a, with the check now. First of all, what is m omega squared? M omega squared from this expression is simply equal to k, because if I square this quantity, is going to be k over m. So m omega squared is just k, or k is m omega squared. So I'm going to take this k as just m omega squared, and I can write this expression as 1 half times m omega squared times x naught squared, and I will be left with, I took m omega squared already from here, so I'm left with the sine squared of omega t plus k. k is m omega squared. I took it out already. So I'm left with the cosine squared of omega t, and what is the thing in parentheses, isn't that just one, no matter what T is? Yeah, because sine squared plus cosine squared, right? Yeah, and that is the conservation of energy that you guys know and, uh, know and love, which means that the, uh, uh, the total energy is independent of time and is conserved. And, uh, and that means that it's equal to the initial energy because the initial energy is just one half of Kx squared. The initial energy when you displace the mass in here is one half of kx naught squared. And k, I just wrote it in terms of m and omega, that's all. Uh, m omega squared is k from this relationship. So it's one half of m omega squared x naught squared. So it's the same thing. In other words, when you displace the, the system back into one uh, position x naught and you let go of it, at that point, that's the only energy you have. You don't have kinetic energy because you will, when you let go of it, you let go of it from rest. So the only energy that you have is potential energy. And of course, when I calculate the total energy at any instant, it must be equal to a constant, number one. And that constant is whatever you calculated it from, which is at equal to zero. So this makes sense. So this is the total energy. And the key with it is that it's a continuous value. 
you could have as much energy as you want free of, of problems so this is how the solution look like as long as you displace it with an inch with two inches with three inches in between okay between an inch and a half an inch whatever you displace it with you're going to get this uh, different value for the energy so the energy is continuous number one uh, if x is not is equal to zero if you take an oscillator harmonic oscillator and don't disturb it at all the energy then is equal to zero so harmonic oscillator minding its own business not moving at all in classical mechanics can have can it take, can have a total energy not a kinetic energy a total energy of zero so these are some of the conclusions that we have another point in here because of the conservation of energy you cannot have the mass going outside of positive x naught and negative x naught so it's always trapped between these two regions okay so it goes to x naught and returns and come back from x naught and start to. So now you guys understand this point in here. It has you when you left it from here, it has potential energy and it has no kinetic energy. So it's going to start to accelerate and get more and more kinetic energy, lose more and more potential until it comes back to equilibrium. At that point, it has all of the energy is kinetic and no potential. So it's going to compress the spring and so on and so forth. So this is a frictionless harmonic oscillator. So it's going to oscillate between negative x naught and positive x naught. Make sense? Yes. Can it be, and this is the question, can it be greater than x naught? Could I find somehow the mass greater than x naught in a position outside of x naught? Is it possible classically? Anybody? Let me draw the potential. It's much easier to see it probably through the potential. Here is the potential energy. And this is x as a function of x. This is u as a function of x. The potential energy at equal to at x equals to zero is zero and is quadratic actually. It's one half of kx squared. This is the function I'm trying to draw. Okay. For x be positive. So it's really a, 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 a parabola, okay? This is x naught. This is negative x naught. The particle is trapped in here in this region, okay? It cannot, this is where negative x naught is. If it has all of its energy at this point is exactly one half of kx naught squared. So it cannot have negative kinetic energy to be outside of this region. So this is a forbidden region. Okay? Cannot exist outside of this region. Make sense? Yes. Okay, everybody else, sounds good? From physics one? Yes. 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 Okay, very good. So here is the deal then. We're going to treat the same problem now, but from quantum mechanics perspective. So now we're going to say we have a particle that is inside a well, inside a well, inside, a, I mean, a, a, a governed by this potential. U of x is equal to one half of kx squared. Okay. So again, if we were to solve this equation, we're going to have a negative h bar squared over 2m, I'm going to do straight to the uh, time independent Schrodinger's equation times dx squared of its wave function. So plus, first of all, the potential. And the potential is 1 half of kx squared times psi is equal to e sub psi, OK? The particle has a definite energy e. Remember, this is the energy in classical mechanics that's how much total energy it has but in here i'm going to assume that they have somehow a particle that is inside this well again and this well is also a quadratic well but the particle has a definite energy e and i want to find the wave function of this equation okay the wave function of this uh, of this particle inside this well okay again we're going to do the same trick as before 
here is the thing. We're going to say the second derivative of psi with respect to x is equal to when we move things around. First of all, the 2m in the numerator divided by h bar squared. I'm going to put a minus in here. So I'm going to, we're going to have u, I mean e, not u, the energy e minus, no, did I put it in the wrong place? No, it's the other way around. If I have the minus in there. So uh, I know I'm starting to probably we should take one half of kx squared minus e, okay, times psi. No, actually, the way, first way around was correct. Sorry, sorry about that. Remember the derivative and e have opposite signs. So I really should have e to begin with. So it's e minus one half of kx squared, the whole thing times psi, okay? So again, just this is an algebra moving things around. Here is the trick though. When x is very large, okay? Then this number is going to dominate that one and the solution for the wave equation should look like this. Because the energy is not enough at this point when X is very large. So this term dominates the difference. So I will have minus times minus 2M H bar squared times in this case, K over 2X squared times Psi. Make sense? Yes. Okay, so the solution now is not going to be well behaved at all for extremely large uh, values. And when X is small compared to you, to the scaling factor in here, and the scaling factor has to do with E, 2E divided by K in this case, okay? When X is very small, then in this case, this term can be neglected and we're back to the free particle. So we're back to second derivative of Psi with respect to x is equal to minus 2me over h bar squared times psi. Here is the thing though, x can be anywhere in between those. So we really need to find a solution for this equation. And the biggest question first is, is the system going to be quantized? Obviously it should, because I said so. <laughs> because we called it quantum, Harmonic oscillator. So we better find the energy to be quantized. So where in the world the quantization is going to appear from? Okay, that's the first question. And the second question is, how does it compare to the classical harmonic oscillator? The classical harmonic oscillator has specific properties. One of them is the energy is always equal to one half of m squared omega squared x not squ omega squared uh, x not squared. That's the, um, the energy for the system. And the particle is trapped between these two uh, uh, setup properties for the uh, particle. And then furthermore, the energy can be zero if the harmonic oscillator is frozen, basically not in motion. And that is basically the properties we need to compare these two things. So we need to find a quantization for the energy. We need to find the wave functions. And we need to explain the comparison with the classical harmonic oscillator. This is critical for uh, uh, all kinds of phenomena involving molecules and how they behave and so on and so forth. Uh, so we'll try to answer these questions when we come back in about 15 minutes, around 9.45, right now it's around 9.30. So those are the questions that we need to, uh, to answer and hopefully do some applications for this, this, uh, this problem or this proper uh, problems and uh, be done with it. I mean, obviously the reason why I'm saying these things in here is the biggest issue is gonna be the quantization itself. And it's gonna involve some hard complicated functions, but these things in here, the comparisons in here are going to be critical also for the discussion. Sounds good, everybody. Should meet in about 15 minutes or so around 9.45. Sounds good. So I'm gonna uh, pause the recording, but I'm going to hope uh, not sh shut down uh, Zoom. So we're going to just basically pause and come, come back in here when we resume, we're going to resume the recording. Thank you. Welcome back to the second part. How's it going everybody? I'm super excited. Yep, let's do it.
Let's finish it, okay? Okay, very good. So let's finish. Let me share with you the screen to see where we're uh, supposed to be. Okay. So uh, this is how the potential look like. And the first question really is where in the world the quantization is going to appear from? Because we don't have boundaries. We don't have boundary conditions like before. We don't have anything really that looks anywhere familiar to at least the particle in the box or the particle in the finite well or even that of uh, that hit uh, wall. So at this point, it looks like it's hopeless. But let me explain what that quantization is going to come from. It's going to require map that you probably have not seen so far. and. Uh, but we're not going to do it. Okay, it's going to be really calculus outside of the scope of what uh, you guys have done so far. But I'm going to explain a little bit where that is coming from. Look at this equation when x is very large. It has a psi that is equal to some term times x squared. Actually, forget about everything else. It's x squared times psi itself. Okay. So what we do normally is, if we start with a well-behaved, uh, well-localized wave, we use a Gaussian for it. If we do that, it's going to be something like this. Psi is going to be something times an exponential of some constants, which I'm going to just call alpha squared at this point times x squared. What this is alpha squared is just for scaling purposes. The reason why. The exponential itself, I mean, it's going to involve some of these terms in here that you can clearly see in here, but just because the exponential does not have a, has a dimensionless argument. So if I have an, an, an x squared in here, which is a meter squared, I better have something that compensate for it. One over meter squared, basically, to compensate for that, to write it down. So this is just for scaling purposes, just the wave function is some sort of a Gaussian, that the particle is somehow localized inside this well, inside this well, somewhere in here, because I know the exponential is going to go to zero for both x going to positive infinity and x also going to negative infinity. It doesn't matter. The x squared in here will ensure that this wave vanishes everywhere else, okay? Except somewhere where the classical per particle was supposed to exist. The classical per particle was defined by this energy being exactly one half of kx squared or one half of m omega squared x naught squared. So this is the position for the classical particle. So if somehow I trap my quantized version of this or the quantum version of that inside that well, then this is a good candidate for it. The only trouble with that is that this side in here, which I'm going to make some sort of a function f of x, because it could depend on x because of this combination, must be well behaved. In other words, f of x should not grow faster than how the exponential in this case of x squared uh, 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 drops. Because the exponential drops with uh, far away distances. But this term might grow to compensate for that, uh, for that uh, decrease, and you might end up with a solution that blows up anyway. And you don't want that, because at the end, you want the probability distribution from negative infinity to positive infinity must be equal to 1, because you know the particle exists somewhere. And if this solution were to blow up, this integral will go to infinity. And you don't want that, OK? So at the end, you would want a well-behaved solution all, uh, in all and all. Here is the trouble. <clears throat> if you do an expansion, uh, uh, some sort of a polynomial expansion for this function f of x. So f of x would be some sort of f naught plus some constants. Let's call them a and b. Let's call them a1 plus a2x plus a. This is a naught. This is a1. This is a1 a2 of x squared, but that's because of the, the, it's much easier to follow this way, a3 of x cubed and so on and so forth, okay? So a n at some point of x to the power n and so on and so forth. So this is some sort of a Taylor expansion of this f. 
what you want is the nth term in here to match with the exponential nth term so that the exponential n term will dominate and will kill whatever this might potentially lead to a higher value. So this is what you want. You want the behavior in such a way that this function, first of all, could be anything that is finite. Let's say, for example, it terminates at A3, then the exponential will kill whatever is coming after, and you're fine, and the solution is well behaved. So this is really what you're after. If you do this, here is the trouble. And you say you would want to get this, get rid of this ugliness, basically, that might show up. You will find a recursive. So you go back to the equation, this one, OK? And uh, the original one uh, 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 that you start with, actually, with the e term in it, you start with that one, and you start expanding, OK? And you sub this function with it too. So you do this change of variable in here. So you're dealing with the function f. They call it the function p normally. So I just called it f in here because we're going to do a polynomial. And this is exactly what we did. So it's going to be a polynomial function of x. Okay. So you're going to try conditions on that polynomial in such a way that this, will, this is well behaved. What you end up with is depending on the index being odd. I mean, even a four in here or odd. And there is another a five in here. Uh, depending on that, you will end up with two cases. And when you look carefully at the ratio of any integer, twice as much of the original integer, this is the term that is going to be leading a two over n ratio. And this is twice as much. As a matter of fact, this looks like it's going to have an exponential of twice this number. In other words, the solution psi itself is going to blow up anyway. So it's going to have an exponential of 2 times alpha squared x squared times the exponential of minus alpha squared x squared. And the one that you hope to kill is actually overpowered by this expansion. So you try to hide the, 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 because you will end up with two solutions, actually, the original equation. You hide the, the ugly part. I did, I did not write it. You hide it, hoping that the good part will come up. And then in disguise, basically, the, the ugliness will show itself back in this expansion again. So what you do in this case, you impose condition on this in terms that they have to vanish at some point. That's the only way. So this a ends at some point, they must be zero at some n. Then at some n, I have to impose that. Okay, in, the, in this expansion. And if I do that, then this relationship doesn't matter. Then a n plus two, which is some number times uh, that, that could depend on n, Time is a n, but this one has already been canceled at some point artificially. And if that's canceled, then any subsequent terms would be zero. So in other words, you terminate this expansion. Once you terminate the Taylor series, then the good term will take over and cancel the rest of it. This condition is the one that leads, because remember, it has the energy in it. This equation has the energy in it and has n in it. This is how the expression then will come out. The energy E will be quantized, and it's going to be n plus 1 half times h bar times omega, where omega is that of the harmonic oscillator, square root of k over m, the classical omega. So this is where the quantization is coming from, by imposing swell behaved solution. Because you know that at the end, the solution has to be normalized. The particle exists somewhere. Okay, Because of that, then this is how you're going to end up with a solution. The actual solutions themselves are going to be like this. Size of n is going to be some function in here of polynomials, actually. 
that depend on n polynomials times those, those, those exponentials. Let me write it down for the sake of argument. It's the square root of minus mk in terms of the, the terms in here. And they have x squared divided by 2h bar. Okay. Where k is the not the wave number, it's a spring constant again. I could write it in terms of the energy, but the point being in here is this is the general solution. And they have this x squared term in them that kills these finite polynomials. These are true polynomials. These are called Hermit functions. So again, I'm not trying to get into the details of the mathematics for it, but I'm trying to give you a flavor where that quantization arises from by imposing a well-behaved solution that somehow stay contained so that the particle doesn't really move very far. And as a matter of fact, for P0 is just a constant. The first solution for N equals to zero, because this is the thing, N can be anything in here, any integer, N can be zero, one, two, and so on and so forth. So the zero that was not allowed in the case of the infinite well is allowed in this case, okay? And so for N equals to zero, the solution itself is some constant, which you can, find from normalization times this exponential itself, square root of mk squared over 2h bar. So this is actually a well-defined Gaussian, okay, around x equals to zero. So that's what the center of the harmonic oscillator is. And the second one, psi one, is going to be some constant times x times the whole exponential, and so on and so forth. So these are called Hermit functions. So this is a special function. I mean, the whole thing is a Hermit function, not just the polynomials, okay? So this is basically uh, to give you a flavor of where this thing is headed, okay? Where, where do you get the quantization from? So it's not a boundary condition, but by imposing that the function be normalized, and you will find that the function cannot be normalized unless you impose on the nth term that this nth term terminate. For that, that leads to the energy being dependent on that n itself where you terminate the sum. Obviously, for n equals to zero, we terminate it immediately for the leading term. And that's why you see the leading term, which is a naught in this case, which I wrote it as a c in this case, constant, okay? So that is basically what happened in here. Make sense a little bit? Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> I think it just takes a little more time, to be honest. <laughs> Okay, guys, okay, the bottom line is for the harmonic oscillator, the energy is quantized. That is what you're going to need for your homework problems, and that's what you're going to need for your exams, and that's what you're going to take from this class. Okay, if somebody asks you about the detail, tell them, let me open a book on the Hermit functions, okay? Or let me Google it or something, okay? And usually, we really, at least for this level of this class, we don't really care about this much, honestly, okay? But later on, if you're going to specialize, you're going to need it. So here is the energy levels. So if I go back into the well, the energy levels, they start from when n is equal to 0, they're 1 half of h bar omega. Because if I plug in n equals to 0 in this expression, that's E0, or the first energy level, is not 0. And that is a big distinction from classical mechanics. Remember, classical mechanics can allow for E to be zero, the total energy of the harmonic oscillator to be zero. If it's frozen, this one, even if it's frozen, its energy cannot be zero. <clears throat> and the harmonic oscillator actually, actually uh, models the oscillation of the molecules inside the uh, And this is one of the examples that we're going to get into the solid or something. So when you freeze the solid and try to get it into the lowest energy possible in classical mechanics, basically you could end up with a zero energy, zero entropy. That's what we discussed a long time ago. But in here, even at that level, quantum effects take over so that you cannot have an energy that is zero. So the entropy cannot even be zero at that point, okay? So the quantum effects are really, really a problem in this case because of the fact that the molecules themselves or the particles themselves cannot sit still, no matter how much your temperature is. So this is the lowest energy level. The second next energy level is going to be three halves of h bar omega and so on and so forth. Remember, this is the E 
that we start with. So it's either this one or that one or five halves of H bar omega or so on and so forth. So those are the energy levels that you can have. You're trying to compare that to this number. This is a huge number. And I think this is one of the homework problems that you're supposed to have. So this is what we ended up with, that the energy levels are quantized. And the difference between the energy level, delta En, delta E, between the, and the energy level, the next energy level, and this energy level is independent of N. If you put N plus 1 in here instead of N, plus 1 half times h bar omega minus the previous one. This is simply going to be h bar omega or h f. OK, so the energy levels are independent, are independent of the number. Uh, uh, they are fixed, in other words, this and this, the spacing between them is fixed. It's always this delta E. It's always h bar omega between the different energy levels. So these are some of the properties of the, 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 uh, the quantum uh, harmonic oscillator as opposed to that. And there is always the lowest energy, which is 1 half of h bar omega. OK? And the next one is 3 halves and so on and so forth, Four ha uh, 5 halves, I'm sorry, uh, 7 halves and so on and so forth. All of these are the things that we were talking about. This leads to a major problem in here in classical in, 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 in thermodynamics, at least, is the contribution of the, uh, the oscillations to the specific heats. So that needs to be corrected, actually, using the quantum numbers. Okay, Remember, for a, for a monoatomic gas, you have one behavior. For a diatomic gas, you have a second behavior and triatomic gas. So the more... Uh, 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 the more gases that you're going to have, the more basically uh, uh, elements in the gas that you're going to have, the more contributions you're going to have from the different basically kinetic energies to the specific heats, whether more, uh, at constant volume or constant pressure. But then at some point, you're going to excite not just the, the, the kinetic energy due to translation or rotation, but you're going to, get, uh, trans, uh, to excite actually the vibrational energies. And these are the vibrational energies. So the vibration, for example, if you take a diatomic gas, N2, yes, you're talking about the translation of energy and uh, in all three directions, and that is three halves of KBT, and then you have the rotation in here, and then you have the other rotation in here, so the rotation on this plane and the rotation on the other plane, so that's going to be five halves of uh, uh, a total KBT, but then at some point, the N2 starts to vibrate in and out. So you can find the omega for it. And these are the contributions. Each one of them has its own KBT. And that's why the, the specific heat was off a little bit when you go into uh, even uh, higher energies when you do that. So these are thermodynamic contributions coming from the vibrations of the molecules. This is just for a diatomic gas. For polyatomic gas, you have all kinds of vibrations also involved. Okay, so this is some of the consequences that are coming from here, and they are purely quantum mechanical. You cannot understand them in terms of classical mechanics. Okay, you cannot have that in terms of classical mechanics. So we have an understanding now of what the energy quantization is coming from, albeit I did not really go in detail. I have to be fair with you guys in here. I mean, even the book, I looked at it to see how much they go into. They really don't go into the details, whether for the case of the finite well. Uh, problem and they tell you it's really uh, transcendental equations that is outside of the scope of the book and which is true and we didn't even do that in here either I just gave you a little bit more insight into what, where it's coming from the same thing also happens with transmission of, uh, of a of a on the on the barrier uh, namely for the tunneling uh, uh, quantum tunneling that too I did not do the derivation because that requires also a long lengthy calculation that is actually outside of the scope of this book and again the book also give you the results. So I did the same thing in there. And the same thing in here, the book tries to give you an explanation, but does not go into enough details, honestly. But the details of it is really has to do with terminating that solution, making sure that the integral is finite because where in the world is coming the quantization from here? They don't have boundary conditions. And it's coming basically by imposing that the exponential will win over 
that, uh, that uh, polynomial that seem to also give you twice the contributions if you don't terminate it, and the solution will blow up. So in that case, this is where the origins of the quantization. Furthermore, now which is more important, you have an expression for the energy now that depends on n, and uh, where omega is your classical omega, and h bar is h over two, uh, two pi. Okay, is your normal uh, h that uh, that that is coming from here, and so we have the quantization that the energy is quantized. Furthermore, there is a difference between it and the classical uh, mechanics version in terms of this point. And then there is another one that I didn't mention. Yes, E is equal to zero in classical mechanics and E cannot be equal to zero in quantum mechanics, at least equal to one half of H bar omega. That's it, it cannot be less than that. And there is another point that I was trying to make earlier and, the, and that is this turning points. They're called turning points because of the, the particle returns and goes back in classical mechanics. In quantum mechanics though, the particle has a chance to exist also outside, outside of those regions. If you take the packet that I was describing earlier, doesn't matter which, even this one in here, it has a tail also. It doesn't, it's not exactly equal to zero at X naught. It has a tail that extends in the forbidden region. The same thing on the other side too, okay? And that is the exponential that you saw in there. So, and that is because of the tunneling effect that we saw already. So although this region is, is forbidden, but in quantum mechanics, the particle can exist outside of those boundaries, okay? So those are some of the, 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 the uh, there is another effect that is clearly not similar and hopefully you guys have seen it also because of the exponential, most of the time, a quantum particle probably will find itself in the middle. You can clearly see the wave function is capped in here in the middle at x equals to zero. Whereas in quantum in classical mechanics, if you calculate and see where the particle spends so most of its time, you will find it next to the edges, next to x naught or next to negative x naught because the particle is near here. So it's going to start to gain speed. And as it moves near the origin, it's moving the fastest. V is max in this case, okay? The kinetic energy is one half of V max squared. And the potential energy is equal to zero at the origin. So in this case, it's moving super fast. It overshoots the origin, it continues such to slow down. Until it reaches negative X naught, then it's going to accelerate. So it was stopped, it's accelerating backward. Until it reaches its maximum speed, then it's going to slow down. So while it's slowing down, it's taking lower, longer time being here and in here, where it's slowing down or accelerating, then in here where it's moving the fastest. So this is as opposed to classical mechanics. Classical mechanics predicts that the particle exists more closer toward the ends. I mean, the harmonic oscillator, exists to closer toward the non-equilibrium positions on the outskirts, okay? To where you release it from. Whereas in quantum mechanics, it's the opposite, it spends most of its time in the middle. Make sense this point? Make sense guys or not? Okay, very good. So the point being in here is that there is some distinction between classical behavior and quantum mechanical behavior, and it's all over the place, okay? So obviously if I'm dealing with nitrogen uh, molecule in here for an N2, and if I try to deal with it as a harmonic oscillator and do the experiments, it's going to behave more of a a quantum than a classical, okay? As a matter of fact, if you go back into the molar specific heats and you try to measure them, uh, for uh, certain values of the energies, when they behave, the quantum behavior starts to pick up, they're going to see it behaving as a quantum uh, oscillator, not as a classical oscillator, okay? So this is basically, uh, this is the entire chapter, I believe. Okay, did I miss anything for you guys? <clears throat> All oh, the measurements and entanglements. 
since the okay that has to do with the uh, with the with the with the uh, with the heisenberg uncertainty so we're going to come back to this concepts again when we deal with the uh, with the uh, with the, with chapter 41 because chapter 41 is the same thing as chapter 40 with the exception that chapter 41 has a uh, has more uh, that it deals with 3d i mean addresses the problem really because we get a lot of concepts from the one dimensional problem that we're dealing with but it's not all of the physics so i'm going to defer that to later on when we do chapter 41 and that should be enough for us right now okay any questions before we get into the examples or the problems no everybody's good Yep, I'm good. Okay, very good. So let me look at example uh, 40.8 from uh, the book, which I'm assuming that you guys are going to do the uh, this examples anyway. And don't forget that you're supposed to uh, also uh, finish the calculations for the couple of examples that I'm going to mention in here. So the first example that I'm going to talk about is it gives you a sodium atom of mass 3.8 2 times 10 to the negative 26 kilograms. So this is its mass, M. Vibrates within a crystal. Remember, it can be a crystalline structure. The potential energy increases by 0 0.0075 electron volts when the atom is displaced by 0 0.014 nanometers. Okay. Take an atom, move it slightly somehow. Okay. And this is how much the increase in potential energy is. Treat the atom as a harmonic oscillator. Find the angular frequency omega. Okay. <clears throat> And then, uh, and then what? And then uh, what's the next question? Find the spacing in the electron volts of adjacent vibrational energies, namely h bar omega. Okay. And uh, what is the wavelength of a photon emitted as a result of this transmitted wave? Okay, this is this is uh, important in terms of spectroscopy and in terms of the problems that are coming next. So it gives us an order of magnitude of how big these things are. So again. This is the potential energy, and the potential energy should be one half of k times x naught squared. So this is your displacement. This is your spring constant. So the spring constant is going to be equal to 2u over x naught squared. So all I have to do is just do this numbers in here. I have to convert to a, from electron volt to, a, to, to joules, because I have x naught in meters, or nanometers, that is. So it's going to be two times u, which is 0 0.075 times 1.610 to the negative 19 divided by, this is times, not uh, dot, to, divided by uh, x naught squared. And x naught squared is 0 0.014 squared times 10 to the negative 9 uh, squared. That's going to be 18, OK? Because nanometer is 10 to the negative 9. So 10 to the negative 18 and 10 to the negative 19, it's 10 to the negative 1. So the math should be 2 times 0 0.0075 times 1.6 times 10 to the negative 1 divided by 0 0.014 squared. So this is not a pro this is just an example from page 1345. Okay, I'm just going to get the order of magnitude from this example. Make sense, Connor? Okay, so just to get an idea of how these numbers are. So I'm going to, I'm going to rely on the book in this case, and the answer is 12.2 Newton per uh, meter per meter. 
So this is the, 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 the order of the spring constant that we were using. So this is the spring constant of the molecules. Usually it's about a few hundred nanometers and uh, newtons per meter, which is typical of the spring constants that you're dealing with in, in, your, in your daily experience in your labs, okay? And then omega in this case is going to be just square root of K over M. The book uses K prime for the wave number, I mean, for the spring constants. So uh, not to confuse it with two Ks that we've been de dealing with all along in this class. The first K is the spring constant, uh, is the wave number. And the second day K that they use is the uh, Boltzmann constant. So I hope that you guys are wise enough to know the difference between all of them. So in this case, since it's omega is square, uh, square root of K over M, and uh, it's gonna be square root of this number, 12.2 divided by uh, the mass. And the mass of this particle is given to be 3.82 times 10 to the negative 26 kilograms. So if I plug in the numbers, I'm going to get a high frequency and the frequency of course is angular frequency is 1.79 times 10 to the power 13 radians. This is omega, this is not the frequency, okay? So this is two pi F. So you really have to divide it by two pi to get the actual frequency. And that's actually, the next question is the energy levels, the separation between the energy excitations of this molecules is exactly what I was calling it h bar omega. So the delta E in this case is going to be just multiply this number times omega. And it's a good idea to convert it back to, uh, to, uh, to electron volts, okay? Because that's the unit we use in atomic physics. So again, it's h bar 6.626 divided by two pi times 10 to the negative 34 divided uh, and times omega times 1.79 times 10 to the power 13 divided by 1.6 times 10 to the negative uh, 19. Okay, 10 to the power 13 and 10 to the power negative 34, that's 10 to the power negative 21. And 10 to the negative 21 and 10 to the negative 19, that's 10 to the negative two. So when we all do that, so it's 6.626 times 1.79 divided by two pi times 1.6 times 10 to the negative two, because that is what's left over from the powers. It's gonna be an electron volts, and it turns out to be 0 0.0118 electron volts, okay? Uh, then they ask about the, uh, the, the wavelength, and this is critical for spectroscopy. The wavelength is very important when you're doing problems like this one. So again, it's HC over the energy. There is no point now earlier to convert into uh, into uh, into uh, electron volts if you want to express the expression of 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34. Or you could use the value in electron volts times second, which is 4.13 times 10 to the negative 15. So that is the value for the uh, for H expressed in electron volts second. Remember, it's an action. So it's an energy times second. So it's already divided by that number times C, and C doesn't change, three times 10 to the power eight meter per second, divided by the energy, and the energy is 0 0.0118 electron volt. Cancel the electron volt with the electron volt, uh, and you're gonna end up with second with one over second, and you're gonna end up with meters as you should. Of course, 10 to the negative eight and 10 to, uh, 10 to the power uh, positive eight and 10 to the negative 15, what, five plus three, that's negative eight, okay? You do the math, and you're gonna find a wavelength of 105 micrometer, micrometer or 0 0.105 millimeter. This is a very, very, very long wavelength compared to what we have been dealing with. Remember, the Compton effect is somewhere in here in the order of a nano or a picometer. The, the visible light is several hundred nanometers. And then you're dealing with a micrometer. And then after that, we're dealing with a tenth of a millimeter. This is the extent of a hair. So this is very long wavelength. It's very important to have an understanding of what you're dealing with. This is the microwave. 
Okay, so if you're doing spectroscopy, you have to have an understanding of this wavelength. Make sense? Yes. Make sense these calculations or not? Okay, very good. So all basically what we did was, based on the way the problems were set up, they gave us U, and they gave us X naught, we found K. Once we found K, we're in business because they give us a map, so we find omega. Once we find omega, we can find the uh, spacing of the energy, delta E. So if it were to emit energy, let's say, for example, the uh, sodium is excited to this energy level, so it's going to emit H bar omega. It's going to emit this much energy. And this much energy corresponds to this wavelength. So if I go in spectroscopy, uh, uh, spectroscopy equipment, I will find a line in the emission spectrum that corresponds to this line in this wavelength range. Okay, so that's basically what this is, whole thing is all about. So the problems we're going to focus on are 4028. I'm in problem 28 from page 1355. And then 35, and then 41, and then 44, and then six, 53 and 60, 66. 66 is tied to the WKB uh, method approximation. And the WKB method, uh, approximation is introduced actually in problem 64, then used in problem 65, and then used also in problem 66. And for the problem 66, it mimics the interaction of the qu uh, of quarks as being some sort of a potential, and using the WKB method to find the uh, different energy levels and the, uh, the solutions for the uh, basically the quark model for the proton and how that makes up the proton. Okay. Sounds good? Sounds good, guys? Yeah. yeah. OK. OK. Here is the deal, though. Uh, if you don't know, I mean, if, if, if you have no idea of the WKB method, you really don't care about it. Just use it. Assume the results are true from the previous uh, problem 64 and use it, okay? And they gave you actually, uh, it's just doing that integral, that's all, okay? So without going into the details of it. So let me get into uh, the problems I have in hand. So the first one is problem 28. And for problem 28, it gives you that same thing. In a simple model of a radioactive uh, uh, nucleus, for a radioactive nucleus, an alpha particle. So the alpha particle is a hydrogen, uh, I mean, the helium uh, nucleus, that's all basically, 6.64 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms, super light particle relatively speaking, it's four times uh, heavier than the uh, hydrogen atom. So this is problem 28, by the way. Okay. It's trapped by a square ba barrier that has width of two femtometer. So L is two femtometer. And a femto is 10 to the negative 15, by the way, meters. So again, you have a nanometer, which is 10 to the power negative nine. You have a picometer, which is 10 to the negative 12. And you have a femtometer, which is 10 to the negative 15. Uh, this is basically uh, sometimes called the Fermi because of the fact that we're dealing with the size of the nucleus. So 10 to the negative 15 is how big your, your nucleus is basically in size. 
is trapped by a square barrier that has a width of two femtometer and a height of 30 mega electron volts. So U naught is 30 mega electron volt or 30 times 10 to the power six electron volts. So this is U naught, okay? What is the tunneling probability when the alpha particle encounters the barrier with its kinetic energy is one mev below the top of the barrier? In other words, if U naught minus E is one mega electron volt is equal to uh, 10 to the power six electron volt. In other words, that E, its energy actually is 29 mega electron volt. Make sense? So we have this situation. We have an alpha particle trapped inside the nucleus and it has an energy that is 29 mega electron volt, whereas the barrier itself is 30 mega electron volt. So it has a good chance of basically ending up outside of the, uh, of the nucleus. That is the alpha decay. Okay. Not really a good chance because in classical mechanics, it has no chance whatsoever. Classical mechanics, it can never escape this thing. So it's trapped because it doesn't have enough energy to overcome it. So 29 doesn't mean that it can reach it. But with the classical, with, the, with this theory, so what we're going to do is, we're going to use that formula T equals to G times exponential of minus two times kappa divided by L. Remember kappa, and we have L, we have everything in here. We have kappa equals to the square root of 2m over h bar squared times the difference in energies, which is u naught in this case minus e, okay? And then L is equal to two femtometer. And we have G also, which is equal to 16 times the ratio of this energy over U naught times one minus the ratio of the energy over U naught, okay? So G is straightforward calculated from here. G is going to be equal to 16 times 29 over 30 divided by times one minus 29 over 30. Or if you wish in this case is one over 30 because 30 minus 29. So it's gonna be 16 times 29 over 30 squared. So without doing any conversions in here, so there is no need to convert anything. So G is a factorless term in here, okay? It's a unitless term. So we have this number 16 times 29 divided by 30 squared, finish the numbers. Also, so this is your part, your task now. Kappa is equal to the square root of two times the mass. The mass is given to us, the mass is, uh, 6.6410 to the negative 27. 6.64. So I need to put the, uh, the multiply so that I don't confuse the dots with the 6.64 times 10 to the negative 27 kilograms divided by h bar, h bar squared that is, not h bar, 6.626. Or if I want to, I could leave it outside of the square root, okay? So 6.626 squared times 10 to the negative 68, I'm leaving it inside, times, don't forget the two pi, which is four times pi squared. And then you have the difference of the energies. This better be in joules now because everything is in SI. So the difference in, in energies is just one times 10 to the negative, uh, 10 to the power six. So it's one times 10 to the power six. So it's 10 to the power six electron volts. And an electron volt is 1.6 times 10 to the power negative 19. So again, I will end up with, so this is 68 by the way. So it's gonna be 10 to the power six and 10 to the power 19. So it's gonna be exactly 1.602 times 10 to the negative 13. And that's the end of it. So that's all the powers there. So it makes sense that you guys can find a kappa that is of the order of one over meter. I mean, not the order. It's going to be a units of one over meter. I have a question. What is that? What did you write? 1.0. This one? Yeah, that one. 1.602. Okay. Okay. 
I was going to write 10 to the power six and then I changed my mind because I know 10 to the power six times 10 to the power negative 19 is 10 to the negative 13, okay? Because it's in mega electron volt, the difference in energy is not in electron volts, okay? So we will find a uh, value for kappa, yes? So you have everything, we have all the ingredients, now finish the T. Finally, finish the transmission in this case, how much it's going to be? Transmission probability. Probability. So after you find G from the first calculations, which is just 16 times 29 over 30 squared, you multiply it by the exponential of minus two. This is a big deal, okay? Of this kappa that you found times L, and L is very short, okay? L is 10 to the negative 19 and uh, negative 15. So this one better be one over some small number in here. So it's going to be uh, uh, L, which is two times 10 to the negative 15. That is going to be your probability of transmission. Sounds doable? Yes. OK, um, this number you. Yeah, these numbers are usually small numbers. Okay, even, I mean, I know in classical mechanics you have zero, but in this case, it's going to be a probability between zero and 100%. So try to keep things that make sense to you guys, okay? So if you find an answer that is 200%, that means it's nonsense, okay? If you find an answer that is the value of different order of magnitude, if you find, for example, an answer of the order of 10 to the negative 20, that means hardly any, any, any transmission whatsoever. So you question yourself, am I high enough in energy to have that low of a probability? I'm very close from the U0, so I better have a higher probability. Or maybe it's not going to be really excitingly high, it should be of the order of 10, 15% probably, but that's high. Okay? And like 0% for classical particle. But if the gap is low, that's exactly what the second part of the question is. What is the tunneling probability of the energy of the alpha particle is 10 mev below the top barrier. So that means that E should be 20 mega electron volt. So that the difference between U naught and E is 10 mev. So we're gonna repeat the same calculation. The ratio now of this two changes because this is 30 and this is 20. So G changes 20 over 30 times one minus 20 over 30, or it's 10 basically. So it's gonna be 16 times uh, 20 times 10 divided by 30 squared. Obviously uh, the two zeros go away. So this calculation is straightforward a little bit. So it's gonna be 16 times two divided by nine, okay? So you can figure out how much G is. Don't trust these simplifications that I did, do it on your own, okay? You can go back to the original expression for G and then recalculate kappa because kappa depends on also on that energy gap. Kappa is the same expression, except this one in here is not going to be uh, 10 to the power six. It's not gonna be one mev, it's gonna be 10 mev. So it's gonna increase by a factor of 10. In other words, Whatever you found from the previous expression multiplied by square root of 10 from this expression that you found earlier. Here for kappa. But it's going to be everything the same thing. Two times the mass of the uh, of the of the alpha particle divided by each bar squared, which is 6.626 squared times 10 to the negative 68, and four pi squared to make sure that it's h bar, not h. And in here, it's 10 mega electron volt, non -one, not one mega electron volt. So it's 10 to the power seven times the whole thing. So instead of repeating these whole calculations all over again, all you have to do is just multiply the answer by square root of 10 from the previous calculation. That way you save yourself time. And you redo the calculation for t now, and you should find the smaller probability. For one thing, this number increased by a factor of three. 
because square root of 10 is slightly more than three. Since this number has increased and you have the exponential of this whole thing, the L does not change. So this number has gone down by a factor of exponential of negative three. Uh, the E itself is about three, 2.7. When you cube it, it's about 10. So it should drop by a factor of 10. Uh, granted that G will change also. Okay. So it's going to drop the probability when the gap is less, it's about 20 when the energy is here, 20 mega electron volt. This is the kinetic energy. Uh, this is the total energy, I'm sorry. I should always remind myself. And this is U naught. So the difference in energy is 10 mev. It's not enough for it to overcome the barrier for the alpha particle. So it drops and that's true. It should be less probable for it to be on the outside of the other side of the barrier. Make sense this problem? Um, I have a question. Yes. I'm doing it right now. And um, for some reason, I keep getting like a higher number than the, the T I got in A. So the T I got in A was 0 0.0935. But then the T I got in... oh, yes, right. 0 0.09. Okay, what did you find for kappa? Um, for the kappa, I got 4.4 .4 times 10 to the 14th. 10 to the power 14? Uh-huh. Okay, so, and what did you find? Forget about the G, we can find the G now. So it's 16 times two over nine. Did you do that? Which is 52 divided by nine. Okay, provided we didn't make any mistake in here. So Wait, 16 that's divided by nine? What did you say? Uh, 16 times two divided by nine, 32 divided by nine. Oh yeah, I got 3.5, five or five, six actually. 3.5, okay. Six, yeah. so, so this number times square root of three, what is that? So the new kappa, so this is the old from the previous step. The new kappa then must be square root of 10 times this number. Yeah, and then for that, I got 1.39 to the 15th. 1.39, 10 yeah, to the power. Uh, I think, yeah, I think that's where I messed up because I put 11 instead of 15. Okay, let me check now. Okay. Good. Sorry. To the 15th. That should cancel the nanometer from the. Okay, now I'm getting the correct answer. Thank you. Okay, good, good. I'm, I'm glad you guys asked these questions because sometimes uh, that clarifies a lot of things. Anybody else has any question about this one? It should be less because if you find it higher, that means I have to go back and through numbers and check everything, okay? Because that's what we know from classical, me classical mechanics. Both of them are forbidden anyway. Okay, make sense? Okay, I think 35 is straightforward. Chemists use infrared absorption spectra to identify chemicals in a sample. In one sample, a chemist finds that light wavelength of 5.8 micrometer is absorbed when the molecule makes a transition from its ground harmonics oscillator level to its first excited level. Find the energy of this. So it's gonna be H bar omega, okay? Times uh, three, three quarters, okay? Because it went from the ground state, namely n equals to zero. So I'm talking about 35 now. So it went from n equals to zero to its first excited state, meaning n equals to one. In doing so, uh, it has absorbed the h bar omega. And they gave us basically what, uh, what uh, the wavelength is, what lambda is, and lambda, let me write uh, in terms of omega, uh, H bar omega, what is the expression for lambda and the, the wave number? Okay. The dispersion law, H, 
uh, no, not h. No, I'm, uh, the frequency times the uh, times the wavelength is equal to the speed of light. That's what I meant to say. And lambda is equal to c over f. And if I multiply this by two pi, multiply that by two pi, that should give me two pi times uh, c over omega. Okay. So we have. They gave us the wavelength. So from there, we should be able to find what the omega is. So the omega should be 2 pi times c over lambda. So since we gave us lambda, which is 5.8 micrometer, we should be able to find the omega. Once we find omega, we know what the delta E is. Since you asked us about the, the energy of the, the first excited state, it's going to be 1 plus 1 half times h bar omega, which is 3 halves times h bar omega. In other words, once we find omega, because we know what lambda is using the dispersion law, then uh, we know everything about this, this, this problem. Then we can find what the energy level is, OK? If the molecule can be treated as a harmonic oscillator with mass m 5.5, find the force constant. So as we know what the omega is, and we have the mass now, so we can find what K is. So K should be M omega squared. Since we have omega from the previous steps and the mass is given for this molecule, then we can find it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a spring constant. Make sense? Yes. OK, so this is straightforward problem. This is easy problem. And hopefully, you guys can do it. And if you have any questions, let me know. Again, this is finish it yourselves. OK. Let's look at 41 from the same page. It gave you a particle in, uh, of a mass m in a one-dimensional box, basically. It has a following wave function between the region x equals to 0 and x equals to uh, l. So it's the same function, except that it's a combination of two states. I should write it as lowercase psi. Is equal to, which is, depends on x and t now, is equal to 1 over square root of 2 times psi 1. Remember, psi 1 has to do with the, uh, with the sine of uh, pi x over l times the exponential of negative, its energy state, i1 times t over h bar plus 1 over square root of 2 times psi 2. So this is a superposition of two uh, states to give me a new wave function. This is typical of quantum behavior. Obviously, because it's waves, you can have interference. And this is exactly what's going on. In classical mechanics, you can't have it's a one particle. But in quantum mechanics, the same particle now has two wave function, and it's a superposed state state of two uh, uh, wave functions, which is also a wave function. Okay, because the wave function is actually linear. So here, psi one and psi uh, uh, psi three, psi three, not psi uh, two. Okay, psi one and psi three are the normalized stationary state wave functions for the n equals to one and n equals to three levels and E1 and E3 are the energies of these levels. So in other words, psi one is equal to the square root of two over L times the sine of pi X over L and psi three is equal to the square root of two over L times the sine of three pi X over L. And this energies, they have to do with those L's also. Remember, the energy E1 is going to be 1 squared times, uh, uh, you can write it in terms of pi, uh, in terms of uh, uh, h bar, it's pi h bar squared divided by 2 ml squared. And E3 will be simply the same number, but times 3 squared. So it's going to be 9 times E1, 9 times E1, that's it. So this is basically what we know about this problem. So we have everything in here. But this is a complex function. Of course, as you can clearly see, you have i all over the place. Okay? Let's 
find the value of the probability distribution function at x equals to L over two. So what we need to do now is find the probability function itself, which is psi squared. So this is the probability density. They call it also the probability distribution function. So this function, which I'm going to call piece of X now, and uh, because of the fact that in T, okay, because it depends on both of them. So it's going to be, just take the complex conjugate of this function and multiply it by itself. So one over square root of two times one over square root of two is going to be one half. So I'm going to take the one half out. I'm going to have psi one star, but psi one is real, okay? So we don't care about this star in here for it. Because psi one is just a sine of pi x and uh, psi three is a sine of three pi x. So psi times the exponential, now I have to complex conjugate its, its, its temporal part. So it's gonna be plus exponential of a plus i e one, which is this quantity by the way, times t over h bar plus, this is psi one, plus psi two times the exponential of plus i e3, no, e2, e3, I'm sorry, uh, t over h bar, and then multiply that by one over psi one exponential of negative i e1 times t over h bar plus psi three exponential of negative i e3 t over h bar. Then I have to carry the multiplication, that's all. Obviously, when I multiply psi one and psi one, it's going to be psi one squared, and the exponential cancel because they have the same arguments with different uh, signs. When I multiply psi three by psi three, I'm gonna get psi three squared also, and these two exponential cancels. But when I multiply psi one times psi three, I will end up with this E one minus E three. And similarly, when I multiply psi three and psi one, which are the same coefficient, by the way, but in here, I'm going to end up with E3 minus E1. So this is what's gonna look like then. I'm going to have one half, that is coming from that one square root. Uh, so psi one squared plus psi three squared plus the cross product, which is psi one times psi three, open parentheses, the first term, because E3 is more than E1, E3 actually minus E1 is eight times E1. So I'm going to write it as negative exponential of negative eight times I times E1 times T over H bar. This is from this product. The other one is E3 minus E1 and that is gonna be a positive. So it's gonna be the same thing, exponential of positive eight I E1 T over H bar, where E1 is that quantity, pi squared, H bar squared over two ML squared. So having said that, this is a complex number. I'm gonna write the first complex part of it. So first of all, this term, the positive, it's exponential of positive I times eight E1 T over H bar. This can be written in the Euler form as cosine of eight E1, T over H bar plus I times the sine of the same argument, namely eight E one T over H bar. And the uh, complex conjugate, which is the same thing with the negative sign of I E eight E one T over H bar is going to be simply cosine. Cosine of is an odd function, an even function, I'm sorry. So it doesn't change sign. So it's going to stay the same thing, but the sine will flip sine and that's exactly how it's supposed to be anyway. Sine of eight E one T over H bar. Now, when I add these two numbers side by side, the imaginary part cancels. And that's important because the whole thing was supposed to be the amplitude squared and the amplitude is real. So when you square it, it's gonna be real. So the answer better be real independent of I. So that's why this I drops and it would have twice this many, that's all. Twice this much, that's all. 
So the entire probability as a function of x and t then is going to be equal to, first of all, the factor one half times sine squared of x times pi, uh, pi x over L plus sine squared of pi times 3x over L. Those are your psi 1 and psi, uh, psi 2. I'm sorry. There is a normalization factor that I forgot, which is 2 over L. Let me explain what that 2 over L is. In psi 1, I have square root of 2 over L. In psi, two, psi 3, I have also square root of 2 over L. And when I multiply, when I square this number, it's going to be 2 over L, and this one is 2 over L. When I multiply them also, I will have square root of 2 over L times square root of 2 over L. So I will have an overarching 2 over L, and the 2 cancels the 2. And it will be just having 1 over L. And as we expected, the probability density had better be uh, 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 of the order of one over L. I mean, it has dimension one over length. So that when I add it, I'm going to have a probability really, okay? So this is the probability density, not the probability itself, okay? Uh, plus, of course, this cross product of the two signs, which is sine of pi X over L times sine of three pi X over L that is psi one and psi three, times this twice the cosine, because when I add them up, I will have two times the cosine. So we'll have a two i's in front of it, cosine of this eight e one times t over h bar. So they want to find this expression at what location? At x equals two, l over two. So we're going to plug in x equals to l over two, x equals to l over two. Well, note the sign in this case of pi times x over L is going to be when x is equal to L over 2 is going to be uh, x L over 2 cancels that. So it's going to be sine of pi over 2, which is 1. When you square it, it's going to be 1. How about the sine of 3 pi x over L at x, uh, uh, x equals to L over 2? That is going to be uh, L over two times L over two. So it's gonna be sine of three pi over two, which is sine of 270 degrees, and that is a negative one. So when I square it in here, it's going to be one still. But in here, I will have a positive one, and here I will have a negative one. So it's gonna be a negative two anyway. So here is the answer then. The probability density look like this. P sub X of T is equal to, uh, first of all, one over L. I will have one, which is one squared really. And I have a negative one squared, which is another one. But I have in here a negative two, a negative uh, positive one and negative one, that is a negative. But I have a two in front of them anyway. There is a two, negative two times a sine, or I'm sorry, cosine, because this is one in the, so it's gonna be cosine of eight. E1 T over H bar. So this is the expression that we ended up with. I have one plus one, which is two, and another one, two in here. So it's going to be look like this. It's going to look like two over L times one minus cosine of eight E1 T over H bar. Okay. The probability has to be always positive no matter what. The cosine is at max equals to one. So if it's one, this whole thing is zero. One minus one is zero. At min, it's going to be two. So it's going to pill a negative one. That is one minus minus one is going to be positive two. I mean, we can use another trig identity that we used so far, namely that the cosine of twice alpha is equal to, uh, what is it? Uh, equals to one minus twice the sine squared of alpha, then in this case, I treat one of the eights as being two times four, and that should be enough for me to cancel things around because then cosine of eight E one T over H bar is equal to one minus two times sine squared of four E one T over H bar. 
And that is exactly one minus this number, one cancels one and the one times uh, minus times minus becomes a plus. And the probability will be indeed always positive, positive as we expected because it's actually the square of the amplitude. And the square of the amplitude better be positive. So it looks like from this shape, it looks like it might be negative, but it is not if we use trig identities in here. So it's gonna be four over L times uh, sine squared of four times E1 T over H bar. Okay, squared. Okay, I, I think I made the point in here of the fact that this probability is at worst equals to zero when this term is zero. So it oscillates in time in that location. It goes up and down between zero and four over L. So if I plot this function in here, it goes between zero and four over L, okay? So the wave function it oscillates with time. And not the wave function, I'm sorry, the wave function oscillates with time and space. But the, the, the actual probability density is actually the one that is, that is the one that tells me about the, where the particle is, okay? So it's a time dependent behavior. So remember E1 is equal to pi squared, h bar squared divided by uh, uh, two ml squared. So, uh, you will have an H bar canceling one of these H bars. So the argument in here is going to have this, this time multiplying factor. As a matter of fact, I think the next question, find the angular frequency at which the probability of this changes with time. It is not the coefficient of T in this expression because you have a sine squared. It's actually this coefficient of T, okay? Because if you plot the function uh, 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 sine squared, the sine squared changes same for the same period twice. So the period is not this whole thing because the sine goes like this. So you might be tempted to think that this is, it's omega. This is its angular frequency with which it changes the coefficient of T. But actually it changes half of that because it repeats itself with half that period. Because when you square it, this goes up and this goes up. So it repeats in this period. So the coefficient should be actually this coefficient, 8E1 over H bar. So the angular frequency in this case is going to be 8 times E1 over H bar. This term, okay? So that is the omega with which this is oscillates, eight E1 over H bar. In other words, the gap in, in energy, okay? The gap in energy, namely H bar omega, this is a harmonic oscillator anyway, between two energy levels, one and two, so doesn't matter, so one and three, it's going to be, so there is a two in between them in here, uh, given, this is not the harmonic oscillator. What am I saying in here? This is a particle trapped in a ga in a, in a well. Okay, so we have to, we have to be careful in here. So the first energy level is at one here, and then you have two, which is four times as much, and then you have three, which is three squared, which is nine. The gap between them is nine minus one, which is exactly what we need. Eight times the fundamental frequency, and the fundamental frequency is that quantity. Okay. And that is given by the, uh, the, 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 the emitted, if you wish, frequency if this one was excited to the third energy level, it's going to, uh, to get it to, to, uh, to re-emit it back. So it all fits back. It all fits well in the spectra in here, okay? But it's the probability density, this is a temporal behavior, of course. This is time, T, and this repeats with this frequency, angular frequency. In other words, the period in here, T, the space between this one and this one, the time it takes between the two different oscillations, if you wish, is going to be two pi over this omega, over this whole number, which is eight E times H bar, okay? So this is the frequency with which, or the time period for this repeti repetitive uh, oscillations. Does Do these problems make sense to you guys when you do them this way? They sound too mathematical, but then when you start explaining,
Sorry, Natasha. <laughs> okay, the question is, are they doable or not? Forget about the, uh, the fact that they are hard. Okay, they are doable. You need to be patient. Thank you very much. <laughs> they, you need to be patient. You need to uh, go through them step by step, basically. Okay. So, the uh, problem 44 is kind of easy. It has one dot on it. Problem 60 is actually not hard, as I was saying. It's, a, it's actually plotting the data. So, hopefully, you guys can do that. If you have difficulties with it, please let me know. The problem 66, it has three dots for the fact that you have to do those hard integrals, that's all. So even if you have never heard of quantum mechanics or physics at all, and you would want to do math, this should be uh, something that you can do the integral and basically place the val values in there. And uh, hopefully you will have an understanding of the model of the hydrogen for the proton using these quarks. Obviously this is just a model. This is not the real stuff that is going on in there. Sounds good, everybody. Yes, maybe, maybe if we work on them, we'll get them. Okay, very good, thank you, Alex. Okay, here is the deal, guys. I think we have had enough. Somebody has already mentioned the fact that it's too much. So what I'm going to do is leave you to it, guys. There are some videos below this ones that we go through these similar problems. We may not go in depth. Sometimes we go more in depth. So sometimes we just skip few things or we make mistakes here and there. So hopefully you guys will catch those and watch those. And also, if you have any questions, you let me know. We should be ready for exam, uh, exam uh, two, okay? After the homework and all of these things are done. And, uh, but we're going to start chapter 41 next time when we meet. And, uh, and I think the lab is during the, those, during the spring break, I'm going to move that to outside of the spring break. And uh, I'll see you guys after the spring break. Yay, have a good spring break. Thank you, you too. Have a good spring break, Professor. Thank you, you too. So I'm gonna stop the recording. And I will see you guys after that, okay?